Hi everybody and thank you very much for watching another episode of Gaffer and Gear. Today we're going to take a look at a light that is definitely not for everybody, but it is quite unique in the market. That's the Zola Toleman 30S. Now this light is very battery friendly with a typical maximum power draw of around 100 watt, but it can output a lot of firepower due to its native 25 degree beam angle lens system. Now, if you want to spread that out a bit more, you can use a diffuser to spread it to 40 degrees or flip the diffuser over and get a very even 88 degree beam spread. The light also boasts a tungsten SSI score of 87 and a daylight SSI score of 90. So why wouldn't this light be for everybody? After all, it's got some of the most impressive color render scores that are currently on the market. Well, the light is only bicolor, and in terms of being bicolor, it does have a bit of a reduced CCT range. Its bottom CCT is 3200, and its top CCT is 5600. Now, for a lot of you, they're the only two Kelvins that matter anyway. Now, in terms of the next negative, the light has DMX, but it doesn't have CRMX Lumen Radio, which is fair enough for the price point. But in addition to that, it also doesn't have any DMX cable inputs. If you want to get DMX into this, you've got to do it over Wi-Fi. Now, if neither of those things bother you, this is an incredibly well-built light and it has some very good low-cost accessories. All right, so let's go through how much this light costs and what you get for your money. And at the same time, we'll go through the costs of the optional extras and get them out the way as well. All right, so the light sells for 499 US dollars and I've seen it listed for 999 Australian dollars. Now for that money, it comes with a bag. Now everything fits snug and secure into the cutouts in the bag, so it's all well protected. Okay, let's start going through the contents. You get your original power plug, which has an IEC lead. So this plugs into the power supply. You get a 36 watt power supply to run the light. Now, this is a little bit unusual. You get a spare handle. So I've never seen that before with any kits. I, I assume it's a spare handle because I can't figure out where else it would attach to the light. You get in this little bag a screwdriver to attach the spare handle and you also get an antenna for your Wi-Fi and Bluetooth connection. You also get a cable that connects the remote control to the light, which brings us to the next thing we're going to pull out. The light also comes with a hardwired remote control. Now the user interface on the remote control is identical to the user interface on the light, making it very easy to operate. And of course you get the light, which is a little bit of a challenge to get out of the bag because it is very well packed. Okay, let's do a quick walk around of the light. Now the light does look big and bulky, a bit like a 1980s Volvo, but it is very lightweight. In terms of the design, they've decided to sacrifice a slick look for thermal dynamics, giving you a longer life on the LEDs. The stirrup is an all metal design with a junior and baby pin combination. The locker is also steel with a ratchet design. The tilt lock is all metal and again features a ratchet design. This has a combination disc brake and Rosetta system. Unlike other Rosetta systems, you can go halfway between the Rosettas and lock it down. All of the corners have rubber bumpers to protect from impacts, but of course, this won't protect the antenna. On the rear top of the light, there are three cooling fans, which run very quietly. On the back of the light is a V-mount battery plate for your battery operation, and you've also got two plates for mounting the power supply. You can mount the power supply on the left or on the right, or if you're feeling like a bit of a rebel, you can mix it up from time to time. I would suggest mounting the power supply on upside down so you can easily access the locker on the IEC lead. Even with the power supply on, this is still a very lightweight unit, so you could leave it attached when you swing over to your battery operation. On the bottom of the rear plate, we have inputs for our remote control, DC power 36 volts, and we have our on-off power switch. On the top of the light, we have the opening for our accessory slots, which have solid locking mechanisms. We also have the terminal for mounting the antenna. On the front of the light, we have our LED array with its native 25 degree lenses. There is a lot of space between the LED panels and the front diffuser to ensure that you get an even distribution of light. The front of the light also has three accessory slots for neat and secure mounting. 
Okay, let's go through the user interface and it's really quite simple. If you want to adjust the Kelvin, just press function one. This light adjusts from 3200 Kelvin up to 5600 Kelvin in 50 Kelvin increments. If you want to adjust your brightness, just press function three. This light adjusts in 0.1% increments. Also on the user interface is a mode button. Now I suspect this is part of their general user interface that's across all of their lights. Because when you use this, you can select between CCT and effect, but if you select the effect, the only option down the bottom that works is the intensity. You cannot get an effect to play and you cannot select an effect. Okay, let's have a quick tour of the main menu and the first option is light control. In here, you can select your dimmer curve or you can enable and disable the extended low light mode. Now I've had a play with this mode and I can't really see what it's doing. Back in the main menu, the next option down is your DMX settings. You can select your address, your mode, your loss of behavior, RDM, and reduce channels. You can also select if it's a master or a slave. Now this light doesn't have wide DMX or CRMX lumen radio. So your only options for DMX control are Artnet, which is the next thing in the main menu. You've got some Wi-Fi options here that you can use for updating the light over phone app. You've got Zola Link options, which is their proprietary phone app and you've got settings. In the settings, you've got the usual choices like language selection. You can adjust the brightness of the LCD screen, flip the LCD screen, change your fan modes, and do a factory reset. All right, so let's start going through the accessories, starting off with the barn doors. And these barn doors have an elasticated spill guard between the barn doors and the light here, so you don't get any spill light coming through. Now these barn doors do, a, do as good a job as any other set of barn doors would on a panel light like this. Now these barn doors sell for 49 US dollars or 119 Australian dollars. Now in terms of other light control measures, you can buy these honeycombs. So this is a 30 degree honeycomb and this is a 60 degree honeycomb. These are made from metal, not plastic. And these sell for, these sell for 59 US dollars each. And the last accessory you can get is a softbox kit. Now I don't know if a hundred watt is gonna be enough to really put through a softbox, but it might be for some of you. Now I've paid a lot of money for softboxes that are equally as good as this. So it's sort of a little bit like a snap bag softbox. Very easy to put on and very easy to assemble. Very neutral uh, silver reflector material. You also get in the kit, a what I'm gonna call a full diffuser. It looks a little bit like a magic cloth, but it's got a bit of a grain texture to it. And you also get a grid. So this is sort of a, a loose sort of snap grid design. It's, um, it's got a bit of support uh, in the edges here. And what I found interesting is it actually makes it very easy to put this on. Now the softbox sells for 49 US dollars, 119 Australian dollars. All right, let's see how the light performs with and without these accessories. Let's start off by having a look at the light with no modifier attached. And it is definitely delivering a 25 degree beam. Now I've exposed the image here so you can clearly see the 25 degree beam, but also see into the drop off areas around it. The 25 degree beam has a very uniformed color and a very even exposure. But into the drop off areas, there's a bit of green hue shift as well as a Kelvin drop. At 5,600 Kelvin, I measure the center of the beam as having a zero delta UV. In the drop off area, I measure the delta UV at plus 0 0.0089, which makes it green to roughly the equivalent of somewhere just under a half correction gel. And there was also a drop in CCT here of about 1000 Kelvin. At 3200 Kelvin, the difference between the center of the beam and the drop off area is nowhere near as extreme. The difference is close to the equivalent of a one quarter correction gel. Now here are some quick spectrometer grabs. And as you can see with no modifier, it is reading a bit high on the Kelvins. Now let's take a look at how the light performs with the side A diffusion facing outwards. Now this combination delivers a 40 degree beam with a lot of drop off. So to set your expectations correctly, it might be best to think of this as a very wide beam with a very even 40 degree hotspot in the center. Now this light in combination with its modifiers doesn't have any hue shift on its drop offs that you need to be worried about.
Now here are some spectrometer readings. 3200 Kelvin isn't bad, but at 5600 Kelvin it is a little bit under with its CCT. Now let's have a look at the light with side B of the diffuser facing out. And this gives a very even 88 degree beam. But unlike with the other side of the diffuser, this has a very gentle drop off on the edges. Now all of my technical data at the end of this episode is captured using this side of the diffuser. Now let's have a look at the light with the 60 degree honeycomb. And I'm using this in combination with side B of the diffuser facing out. Now I found side A gives you more light level, but it has a hot spot. But as you can see here, side B gives you a very even and consistent beam. Now let's take a look with the optional 30 degree honeycomb. And despite this honeycomb covering a large area of the diffuser, I actually got more light level out of this with side A facing out than I did with the 60 degree honeycomb with side B facing out. Now let's take a look at the optional softbox. And I'm using this with side B of the diffuser facing out to get an even illumination over the softbox diffuser. Next I tried it with the supplied grid, and this does an excellent job of containing the spread of the softbox. Now let's take a look at all the data I've collected, starting off with AC power draw. Now from this point on, all of the photometric data mentioned is taken with side B, that's the flood side, of the diffuser facing out. After several days of testing, the maximum power draw recorded was 104 watt. At 3200 Kelvin, I measure 103.1 watt, and at 5600 Kelvin, I measure 101.2 watt. Now let's take a look at the average CCT accuracies. Between 3200 to 4000 Kelvin, the light is typically out by plus 57 Kelvin. From 4050 to 5000 Kelvin, the light is typically accurate to plus or minus 20 Kelvin. Between 5050 to 5600 Kelvin, the light is typically out by minus 23 Kelvin. Now let's have a look at colour render measured in TM30RF. From 3200 Kelvin to 3350 Kelvin, it scores a 95. From 3400 to 4000 Kelvin, it scores a 96. From 4050 Kelvin to 4600 Kelvin, it scores a 97. From 4650 to 4800 Kelvin, it scores a 98. From 4850 to 5250 Kelvin, it scores a 97. And from 5300 Kelvin upwards, it's back to 98. Okay, let's take a closer look at some of our more common CCTs. When I dialed in 3200 Kelvin, I got 3293 with an SSI score of 87. The TM30 color render results were 95% average color accuracy with an average 100% color saturation. Here are the CRI scores and they're all plus 90. This is the spectrum distribution. And the white point was very accurate with a delta UV of minus 0 0.0006. When I dialed in 4400 Kelvin, I got 4413. The TM30 color render results were 97% average color accuracy with an average 102% color saturation. Here are the CRI scores and R9 is below 90. This is the spectrum distribution. And the white point came in with a delta UV of minus 0.0013, which would make the light at this point magenta to roughly the equivalent of one half of a one eighth correction gel, which is very good for a bicolor light. When I dialed in 5600 Kelvin, I got 5584 with an SSI score of 90. The TM30 color render results came in with 98% color accuracy and an average 102% color saturation. With the CRI scores, only R9 is below 90 and only just. And the white point came in with a delta UV of plus 0.0021. So if your camera is working to the planking curve, this light will be green to a little bit under the equivalent of a 1 8 correction gel. And if you're working to the daylight curve, the white point is very close to being neutral. 
Well, that's another episode of Gaffer and Gear done. And this is a very unique light. It's definitely not for everybody. It's not for me, but it does offer an interesting compromise of a lot of firepower with minimal battery use, which could be handy for electronic news gathering or on the run corporate videos. Okay, take care everyone. See you on the next episode.